Here we go. We're recording. Hey, guess what, Rob Stenzinger of ArtGeekZoo.com, of, of Interactive-Storyteller.com, of uh, ArtGeekZoo.Posterous.com. Uh, we're recording. Are we recording? Jersey Droves, the ComicsAreGreat.com, and LeaningToArt.com, and many other awesome things. I'm actually getting my name officially changed to Comics Letter R Great. What's up, Comics? <laughs> well, when I was at SPX, uh, what, a month ago? Uh, was it a month ago now? Jeez. Um, and I ran into David Malky, who was on the Comics Are Great show. He just like pointed at me and said, hey, comics. <laughs> so maybe, maybe it works. <laughs> nice. Switched mugs today too. Oh yeah. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not not uh, doing the Starbucks thing anymore, and I'm tired of giving them uh, advertising on the show. They should pay us for me to drink out of their mug. So drinking out of Spidey yeah. today. Yeah, I actually am. Uh, I'm on the unpaid endorsement track for this tea I get from Canada, whatever it is. I know, I'm joking. I don't know where it comes from. It comes from Amazon. Is it a can? Who knows where it came from? Um, okay, the so then, uh, anyway, that's it. Got got a. Uh, I don't know if this is a curveball or not, but it's a thought that occurred to me because I was just listening to the uh, Polytechnicast, that other show you do. Uh, oh. Yeah, that's at ArtGeekZoo.com, dot com. Yes. Uh, yeah, yep. and it's linked on the uh, podcast page on Lean Into Art. That's my favorite display of it, actually. I like our podcast page. The podcast page is looking pretty good. Um, so yeah, you go to leanintoart.com, and then there's a podcast, a little RSS podcasty looking box in the upper right on the homepage, and that'll take you to a listing of all the shows that we do. Um, and so I listened to the latest episode with you and Kevin Cross of KevinCross.net, where you guys are talking about all ages storytelling, the part one of the big crossover thing that you're doing. And, uh, you know, it, it's turning into a, a bit of a... Um, a theme or a ritual on this show that we mentioned, the 5x5 network, because we both listen to like a ton of stuff that those guys do. And more it's, and more all the time. <laughs> I know. I know. We were just talking about this the other day, uh, that I, you got me listening to the shows, and then I wound up digging through their archives and finding more shows that I told you about. Now you're listening to more as a result of turning me on to the, to the network. But it, it occurred to me as I was listening to you talking to Kevin that, you totally could do, uh, this is the seed I'm going to plant in your head, because you don't have enough to do, and uh, you are not nearly ambitious enough in life, uh, taking on difficult and, and uh, challenging and bad ideas. Uh, but you, you, should, you could totally do like a Lean Into Art Network, where you talk to a whole bunch of different cartoonists on a regular basis, because you have such a good style of listening to what somebody's saying, reiterating it to them, and say, is that what you're saying? Am I right there? Uh, and when the, your your uh, co-host or interviewee kind of falls short of an idea, or they're like, I don't even know what I'm saying here, you are really good at coming back to them and saying, I think I'm hearing this. Is this what you're hearing? And then, boom, they're back on their track again, and they're talking and talking and talking. So um, you have a really good listening and, and, and responsive style of talking with people. So I totally think you should do it. Another thing for you to do so that you're just always behind the mic. I am actually liking it as, as far as, uh, I mean, as you've said before, it, it's way more efficient than, uh, well, and others uh, that I think you were quoting at the time. Um, doing podcasts is, is actually far more efficient than doing blogs. Mm -hmm. um, and I know for sort of my lifestyle and whatnot, I find, it, I find them more convenient, too, to be to consume. Because I can just, um, I, you'll often find me, as uh, my wife would confirm, uh, with one earbud in my ear, and it's almost always a podcast. If I have two earbuds in my ear, it's metal. <laughs> one earbud. So this is a, this is a one earbud event that we're doing right now. <laughs> I did not know that. Oh, it, it, almost constant. God, this 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 ties into what our topic was actually going to be, and I had no intention of doing that. But uh, you know, it's like we were talking the other day when we were just having a just a general like meeting thing about all the stuff we got to do for this project. Um, I mentioned how it's come up amongst certain people here and there that people who do a lot of podcasting have a problem with ego, right? They're, they're egotistical because they're they're talking so much. They must love the sound of their voice, and. 
And, 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 and people use as a uh, excuse sometimes to not do things like this, like public speaking or podcasting. It's like, well, I hate the sound of my own voice. Um, well, why are you listening to the shows you do? <laughs> if you hate the sound of your own voice. Uh, why, why are you engaging in conversation if you hate the sound of your own voice? Like if you're at a party and somebody asks you a question, do you not talk because you hate the sound of your own voice? Because even talking is like, whoa. It's, it's an egotistical act to share an idea or to th talk about something that you're excited about, right? It must be because, uh, because the only proper, well-balanced, uh, uh, you know, intellectually or uh, me mentally healthy way to approach life is to hate your own voice. Because the opposite would be you love your own voice. It, it, what if we just took that out of the picture altogether? Let's take the voice thing out of there and just say, are you sharing ideas or are you not sharing ideas? But anyway... The funny thing is that sometimes people say, like, oh, if you do a lot of shows, you must be some kind of egotist who just wants everybody to listen to you, when the thing that I've discovered, and again, this goes back to a 5x5 five five thing, where... Those are iPhone 4 at the door. Be right back. All right. Sorry. Totally apologize. Ah, <laughs> uh, see, everybody, uh, I'm not going to edit this, because... Um, because he'll be back in a second anyway. But this is to give you a little backstory. Is that uh, we we met earlier today, and uh, while we were having the meeting, Rob had to go because he had to check the front door, and I did not know what was so important coming to the door. But now I know he got the new iPhone 4s, and I would run to the door for that too. It's pretty exciting. Um, I think about that that uh, voice command thing that some people are excited about, and some people think are uh, is silly or is overhyped. And all I'm thinking about is, is if they make voice packs, Tom Tom style voice packs for these things where you can plug in, you know, a voice that, of your choice to respond to you. So, you, and like you can call it by name, like say, uh, hey, computer, uh, book me a reservation at this place so I can have dinner there. And if Hal's voice from 2001 Space Odyssey responds to you or Knight Rider responds to you, right? Like all of a sudden it's like, my call, you have an appointment. Was that? Would that be Knight Rider or would that be Saint Elsewhere? <laughs> yeah. Either way, that guy. Uh, if he if he says to you, uh, "I've booked an appointment for you, Michael." Oh my gosh! Who who would not pee their pants a little bit if hearing their phone talk to them like that? So was it the phones? Did you get the phones? It was. Yeah, and I I apologize for that interruption. You know, it's a, makes it natural. It's like yeah. people are like watching our lives. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, should I let you go so you can go set them up? Oh, we're doing a podcast. That's cool. <laughs> right, right. You know. Pretty exciting. Yeah. Got the got yeah. got the voice activated thing. I can't wait to hear how that works. Yeah, cool. I'll I'll be sure to uh, share my impressions. You do a Polytechnicast. So, anyway, where was I before I was so rudely interrupted? Uh, let's see. Oh, I was talking about how the thing I found doing this audio stuff is that it's a lot easier, and this was this was mentioned by Marco Arment on the uh, Build and Analyze podcast, is that it's easier to jot your thoughts down in audio because you just talk. Um, it's more natural, and it's more intimate. A story I've told before is when I was at, I went to the um, the Miami Book Fair in November 2008, and I was I was tabling there. Uh, I was there ostensibly for kids read comics, but I was selling my own books too. And this fellow walks up to me, and without any introduction, no, he doesn't say hi. I'm so and so and such and such. He just comes up to me. He's like, Hey, remember in 2002 when you were doing this thing, and this thing happened, and this thing happened? Uh, I had a question about that, and it was really unnerving for me because I I've not had a whole lot of brushes with fame. But this guy knew about my life because I'd been sharing it through my shows and he felt like he could, you know, engage with me as if he's always from his standpoint, he knows me pretty well. I don't know who this guy is at all. And so then I kind of sat back and blinked. I said, Do I know you? And he's like, Oh no, I just listened to your shows. And then all of a sudden we could, you know, it was like, oh okay. And then we started talking about the thing that he had a question about. Um but anyway th what this isn't about saying like look how famous am I. This is about saying this guy had a really clear sense of who I am as a person because I was sharing stuff in audio. So it's not egotistical. It's a way to become more engaged with your audience, more personal with your audience, and it is a, a very convenient and efficient way to collect thoughts and document them for people who, you know, who's our audience? Who's our audience? Our audience are people who are drawing 
something for them to listen to while they're drawing, right? I mean, so anyway. But the egotism thing it always cracks me up. Go ahead, Rob. I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, it's uh, you did a good job establishing your authority, and I was almost ready to uh, cow down to you. <laughs> Submit. Submit to my ideas here. Never. Do, do, the, it, no, I. Uh, I, I do, do I do I ever I mean be really I know we're doing this publicly but try to if you can be brutally honest with me have I ever pitched have you ever heard me pitch an idea in any of the audio things I've ever done saying like you know this is the way you should just do this if you do this it'll be successful if you don't oh. absolutely I mean if you're you're handing over information but in a, in a way that is so so open, it's like this information is in the same room as you are, but you can pick it up or not. It's not like you're forcing it into someone's hand going, this is yours, and I gave it to you, I bestowed you this thing, and you should now, whatever. And no, yeah. absolutely not. I mean, it. Uh, yeah, the humor comes in the irony in uh, saying that you're doing that, because uh, <laughs> obviously you're totally not, and, and I'm just being a Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> By uh, yeah, pointing out something that just—it's obviously not your style. I, I I sweat that a lot. I really sweat that a lot when I'm doing my stuff and when I'm teaching is to be as egalitarian as possible. Um, the story I told I think last time, where I was talking with a student who was introducing me to a software called Blender and telling me how to use it, and this kid's like 15, and then somebody was there watching I, I may have i don't remember if i told the story last time because we did another two-hour <laughs> marathon episode um yeah, yeah. but the, there was a person there a witness who said uh who, who's teaching who here and to which i responded well this is the way it's supposed to work i learn from them they learn from me and it's a two-way street and you know i wouldn't enjoy this so much unless i was constantly walking away with something for myself as well so yeah i don't know but Absolutely. I mean, I actually, um, I sort of wrestle with that back and forth because I do find there's a difference between, let's see, how people, they, the information you're presenting and how you're presenting it. And you could have something that is fairly useless but stated with such panache and, and emphasis and style. It may sound useful, but um, it that's that's an example of how you can have a mismatch of like the quality of the information versus how it's presented and who's presenting it, what's their intent, and all that kind of stuff. But I wrestle with like there's there's a time when like I know like sometimes when I'm I'm presenting, I care so much about something, and I know people have given me this feedback before that I may sound even though I'll disclaim once in a while there'll be like like a like a a, a long passionate tirade in between disclaimers where I will sound like, no, this is how you do it. And I debate. I'm like, well, is that necessarily a bad thing? It just means I really do care about it. And because, of course, am I open to other possibilities and adjusting and new information? Absolutely. I couldn't have felt so, because some of the confidence comes from being excited about having a tested idea. And the value in sharing it and saying, this has been valuable for me. And then, of course, who knows as far as if it's valuable to you or not. But I'm, I'm so darn excited, I maybe I'm not worried about that at the moment. Yeah, I get you. I mean, I think, I think if you sandwich it between two parentheses at the outset and the outro of these are just things that work for me and then get passionate about it, get into the idea. Because I know... In my workshops, in my classrooms, I've said things like, this is what you want to do. You want this, this, and this. And what I really mean is, is when I'm doing it, this is what I want to do, right? But as long as I've sandwiched it between an intro and outro saying, but these are just my ideas. Um, I, I used to get criticized. <laughs> and what's funny is, <laughs> here's a group of people who say egotism, and there's an equal group of people who say, quit apologizing for all your ideas, Jersey. Your ideas are good, and uh, we know, we're smart enough to know that this is just your idea. You don't need to keep saying it, because I used to start every piece with, and this is just my opinion, but, you know. So you gotta, you got to weigh it a little bit. But um, the other thing is, is that if there's any Q&A in there at all, and people start asking you questions, and they give you a counterpoint, like, well, what about doing it this way? My reaction is, is oh, yeah, you could totally do it that way, too. 
It's just I'm just showing you the way that works for me. And yeah, that one, it, it, I liked it, but I didn't love it, you know. But you may want to try that. That's another viable option, you know. But you, you don't want to waste everybody's time all, uh, either by just filling up, you know, three quarters of your of your speaking time or teaching time with no. Don't anybody think that this is the definitive answer. This is just one way of doing a million things, you know. Say it once. Get it out of the way and then be receptive to when people give you input and I think you'll come out okay. Um, but you know, it's like it comes back to something, going back to this egotistical idea, uh, like this being a sense of egotism comes back to, and this is why we, if anybody's watching the video, we've got this picture of Zod saying Neil and Neo saying never, uh, is that a lot of people, especially in, in the kind of pool that we're swimming around in right now with this Leonard Art thing, non Leonard Art Center, uh, we're talking about the things that we care about in a way that's meant to be useful to people. The model traditionally is, I'm the motivational speaker, I'm the Susie Orman, I'm the, you know, pick your person who wrote 20 books on how to fix your life subject, and here's the 12 steps, because, and as you pointed out, you know, those putting it in steps can be useful, but... And, and, and it's attractive because it seems like now there's this managed bundle for me to wrap my brain around. Um, nobody's ever written a, a, like a successful self-help book that says, well, it's kind of a little bit of this and a kind of a little bit of that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> plan your life now. Um, but anyway, most people assume because of the existing models that if you are putting yourself on any kind of a platform to share information or share thoughts or share reflections on something, that you are trying to position yourself as a expert, uh, guru, right? Well, do you think that, um, do you think, well, I'm asking a question. I don't mean to be trying to hide my opinion behind the question because my opinion is without a doubt in this question. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you think that when people ask that kind of thing, does that also show some of maybe what they're used to dealing yeah. with where um, the common, you know, just there's just expectations built up from experiencing a common model of what is learning, what is sharing, who gets to create, who gets to consume. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it points to what I think is a poisonous attitude of, well, let's talk about another anecdote. I was uh, talking with somebody, I won't name the person, but it's a person who's very close to me, like one of my few, you know, really close friends. And this guy said something of, I can't do X because so-and-so over there already did it better than I could ever do it. And this attitude of there's people out there who are special. There's people out there who are magically endowed with talent or genius or whatever you want to call it, and their very existence uh, refutes any chance I have, any uh, permission that I have, to engage with this thing and have fun with it and do my, whatever I can with it. Uh, because it was preordained. When they were born into this world, some magical voice said, this is the one that will do the thing that everybody will love, and therefore all will you know, despair uh, that, ever, that they'll ever be able to do it. Uh, and I got really mad at this guy. I got really mad. And, I, and the irony was that I turned to him and I said, I forbid you to ever talk like that again. <laughs> But, but, I mean, you know, this idea of... What's that, Rob? I said trying to find a good use for the authority. <laughs> well, you give your power away. Fine, here, I'll take it. <laughs> or your power. Yeah, I said, here, I'll, I'll take the power that you're giving me to tell you that you have that power. Now, shut up. Um, <laughs> no, you know, it, it's, I think that this comes from the fact that, you know, people... You know, it's in our lizard brains to respond to authority. You know, somebody who talks big and makes a really good, compelling case. We're like, wow, that guy really knows what he's doing. I guess we should follow along. It's it's perfectly human for us to respond to that. But on the other hand, we have an equal, um, you know, human responsibility to, to be, well, at least us in the West. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that either. I mean, this exists in all cultures, a sense of self-determination that we got to get involved and do something too. And just because somebody came out and did it well, the proper response is to say, oh, I want to do that too. And I'll find my own path that will be equally awesome and glorious as what this person did. They showed me that, that, that I can do it too. But then there's people who submit to that idea of once it's been done. I mean, how many times have you heard that too? It's been done. I hate that. It's such, it's such a way to like just unplug from having to do anything or to uh, get excited about something because uh, it's been done. 
Absolutely. I, it's, a, it's a way to back out, to manage your risk of, uh, of being judged by just uh, not playing and, and going away. When there's a, what if, what if we had a different situation that, what if you were exposed to that amazing artist, whatever they do, and let's say it's, it's you know, you have, or, or that friend or, or whoever, right, is exposed to that. And, but it's not this, the context of a international success um, endorsed by these large institutions and adding all this weight which I agree. I mean, we're, we are wired to do that. Those are patterns for uh, success and in, 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 in doing, you know, useful stuff. Because like the collective intelligence voted them up or whatever. Yeah. It's not always bad. Yeah. But like, what if the collective intelligence, whatever you're listening to, didn't vote them up? They just moved next door and you and they said, hey, listen to this. Uh, you know, can you you know check out this MP3 I made? Yeah. And would you see them as more of a peer then? Or, or just a really, ta or like a really talented friend, where you're like, um, how would that filter what you experienced, right? Um, and uh, mm -hmm. would that make it seem less of a, of a barrier? See, and, and that's that's the part that really bums me out is that I think, for whatever reason, you know, this could be naive, naivete on my part. I I fully own the fact that. In a lot of respects, I'm very naive when it comes to engaging with people, and I and I, I think to some people that's what makes me endearing to them. To other people, it makes me really off-putting. Um, you know, we've had a lot of private conversations about how there's a, there's a substantial number of people I've known in my life who think that I'm I'm very arrogant, and then there's a substantial number of people who think that I'm very kind. You know, <laughs> it's, it's everybody gets to feel that way. I, I'm I'm cool with that. But um, where I'm going with this naivete thing is that. I remember when I met Dan Mishkin for the first time, and I was very excited about this because he created a lot of characters, wrote a lot of stories that really had a profound impact on who I became as a storyteller. In, in a very large part, he was responsible for driving me in the direction that I went. Is that I read the books he wrote, and I said, I want to do that. Um, so when I met him, I communicated that to him. And uh, so once I got that out of my system, once I got the whole, thank you so much for doing this thing that was really important to me, and then we started talking about storytelling. I started talking about, oh, this thing you did in Amethyst Number 6 with the part where so-and-so uh, gets eaten by the Emissaries of Varn. It was one of the most haunting things I've ever read, and here's why. And then we started to get rolling into talking storytelling, and I could have been talking to my next-door neighbor at that point. It wasn't a whole, oh, I worship you, I admire you, and I'm going to defer to everything you say. As a matter of fact, we had dinner together months later. Uh, he actually asked me, and I was really excited. I was like, wow, he asked me to dinner. I get to have dinner with the guy. Um, and we were, you know, locking horns on a lot of things. It was like, no, 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 no. You don't do that with superheroes. You do this with superheroes. Now, who was I to say that? This guy worked for DC. He wrote Superman. I never did. I don't get to say that. But as soon as I'm engaged in talking about the subject, it doesn't matter who it is anymore. I, I forget who the person is, and I just get lost in the talking about the subject. Um, and I don't know... If this is a, like a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know if this is something where I train myself. This is just something that I noticed happens when I get talking about my favorite subject with people. Is that it, it could be somebody I actively dislike. If they want to engage in the subject in 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 a way that's meaningful to me, I'm happy to talk about it. And I get excited and I forget who the person is essentially. Um, so going to your point about would it change if they were your next door neighbor or not? I like to think that it wouldn't for me, but I think for a lot of people it would. I think for a lot of people, it's like it's like when I went to Kinko's a while back, and I just talked about this on Comics Are Great. Um, I went to Kinko's with my Boulder and Fleet mini comic that I was getting printed up for SPX, you know, last month, and they said, "When are you gonna get this thing published?" That's that's what the copy clerk said to me, and I said, "This what I'm doing right now. This is publishing. I'm gonna take this home and staple the books together, and I'm gonna take them and sell them at a show." And they said, "They said, no, no. I mean, you know, published." You know, with with uh, with a publisher and with being on Good Morning America and all that stuff, and and I said, well, I guess that is that is a kind of publishing, yes. But uh, you know, I'm happy doing it this way. This is the way I want to do it. And they're like, oh, oh, okay. You know, um, to a lot of people, that kind of like you know the the hundred million smokers can't be wrong idea works, right? So, well, I was wondering. Um that's interesting. Uh, I mean, I 
what's funny is I would have to think for a bit to come up with, uh, like when, when I actually first met you in person, Jersey, um, mm -hmm. because I mean, I wasn't, you know, doing any kind of hero worship, but I mean, I have huge respect for the things that, that you've done, all, all the comics and the podcasting and the teaching. As you should. And it was uh, exciting <laughs> to, to meet you. And what's that? I was just kidding. I was, I was being a jerk. <laughs> Did you add one more thing on there? Uh, I said, I said, as you should. <laughs> as I should. There you go. Secret, secret jersey. Come there's, out. there's the arrogance. Yeah. No, no. But anyway, yeah. So uh, you're excited. Yeah, and um, but if I think like, well, what, what led to the conversation getting past that initial nerve thing? And I think when you have something in common where you've actually have chosen to, like you, I'm, I'm me, right? I think because I actually had spent some years working on comics and thinking about them and uh, and thinking about uh, teaching and whatnot. Like I had mentioned, like it, it's essentially doing teaching. That's how I met my wife, um, even though you know the corporate world and all that kind of stuff. Uh, different context, but you know, all of a sudden we had these experiences that were in common. And maybe it, it's by uh, because I didn't put up barriers that stopped me from getting those experiences. So once I did meet someone that I was, you know thinking highly of, it, it didn't stop at that, at the, um, oh gosh, you know, I'm just tripped up because I have nothing else to say besides some weird kind of positive feedback for you. Right, mm -hmm. right. I'm a fan of everything you do, right? That's, yeah, if that's all you got, then it's tough, right? But even then, right, it's, but then, even then, it's like you can find like a, one special thing that they do that nobody else does, and that starts a conversation, right? Oh yeah, very true. Because there's some, there's some um, maybe some people you just won't have anything in common with uh, to that extent. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously you mentioned you, you go the solo independent route and you've been doing it way for a while. So chances are people who've been doing that may have some interesting, similar experiences, but different perspective and adventures to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just theorizing. That, hey, maybe that's that's like a, an interesting way to, uh, well, to emphasize that not stopping because of the harsh judgment. I mean, you end up building up this, you end up uh, creating your own counter to that argument of I'm, you know, uh, who am I to create this stuff because it's been done already, and I like that what this other person does so much that I could never compare, and how dare I? publish my thing because... How dare I? Uh, I love that. I love that. People think that's humility. They think that's humility, don't they? And it's, it's just, it's, it's a destruction of, of a perfectly serviceable and healthy word. You know, a sense of humility is a good thing, right? It's like, like understanding that, yeah, I got stories where people came up to me and knew who the hell I was. I went to Detroit Fanfare and somebody recognized me across the floor and I did not know who they were. They knew me. Pretty cool, right? That everybody wants to have that kind of thing. But, you know, I go to Trader Joe's to buy oranges. Nobody knows who the heck I am. And if this society ever came tumbling down, I'm the first to die. I'm the first to be up at the top of that tree and starve to death because I have no serviceable skills outside of my own little, you know, bubble that I built around myself. A sense of humility is a good thing. But when you turn it into, oh, I need to be humble, uh, therefore, how dare I? Oh, that's terrible. Nobody should feel that way. Uh, I'm going to say that that maybe that is uh, so. Listening to you know, folks like uh, um, Lawrence Lessig and his theory that uh, his theory is related to uh, participatory culture. That maybe this is a skill that we all have, but now it's atrophy. This is my take on it. Um, maybe. Uh, we would be more comfortable with it. I mean, so look at you. Have, you probably have relatives that knit, and some that might do pottery, and some that might. But there's probably gaps as far as not everyone, unless you. Some families have a culture that really reinforces being creative and whatnot, but mm -hmm. um, many don't, and it's kind of few and far between where you run into people who feel just personally cool with the idea of yeah, I make stuff, and then it's even more rare where it's like yeah, I make stuff and I share it. And it's not the secret thing that I do, um, because yeah, there is a lot. And may, so maybe if that were just more normal, right? So maybe if if uh, uh, that we could we could make the perspective of uh, I'm not worthy and and how dare I? Because 
how dare you as far as what compared to um, like this this giant brand that's been you've been exposed to for most of your life, such as a Marvel or a DC or a um, uh, I don't know. And you pick any large brand. I mean, so you have a giant ecosystem entity uh, or a giant entity in an ecosystem that, I mean, they're about, they've done a great job of spreading that idea. And you don't have those, that capability necessarily as an individual. Um, they're really good at solving that problem. And so since that's been around for so long, maybe, um, I don't know, we've, we've undervalued, we all have that ability to solve that problem. It's just maybe I'm not at that scale. So, mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's fine. You don't have to be um, a worldwide recognized brand of a, of a pop artist or metal band or book author. Still valid creative action. Yeah, right. And it, it just occurred to me that we need to put in the parentheses. Anybody who's listened to the show for any amount of time knows that we're not trying to push the, this, this as some kind of like self-help seminar. Uh, or some yeah. kind of easy stage of like reshape your life into something that can make it better. Um, but what, so, so that's parenthetically there. We're not trying to do self help stuff here, but what we are trying to puzzle through is. Sounding a bit self helpy? A little bit self helpy, but you know what? Sharing information is a form of self help, isn't it? Like anybody who seeks information to improve themselves is trying to help themselves, right? But it's just like that, that's another term that's been kind of poisoned by this well of, uh, you know, who moved my cheese kind of thing. Is that the name of that book? Yeah. <laughs> Should I put it in the Amazon affiliate link in the show notes? <laughs> if you don't, if, uh, if anybody listening doesn't know about that book, don't even worry about it. You were one of the lucky ones who missed that book. So. Yeah, there's a sort of, there's a part of you that will die by by looking at that book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't often attack you know specific things, but. Uh, you know, that's, that's, it's one of those emblematic books of, you know, the thing that the middle management hands out to say, now when I start asking unreasonable things of you, read this book and it'll make you feel better. <laughs> it's my completely messed up view of reality that I want you to subjugate yourself, but I don't feel so bad about it. Right, right. <laughs> oh, man. But so I know I can, I can come off as self-helpy and whatnot with that. It's just the, I have strong feelings on the topic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's cool that Hey, you know what? I have certainly fought many a creative demon and uh, negative feeling uh, on all this kind of thing as far as working through my own issues to uh, become a uh, better at what I do mm -hmm. with creative projects, whether it's code or visual art or anything, podcasting, whatever. So, um, so you're saying that you're not, you're not just, you don't feel empowered and confident all the time? Is that what you're telling me? Right. I don't. But in a general and, and I certainly haven't before. What's that? In a general sense, though, I bet you feel more confident now than you did when you were starting. In a general sense, I mean, like, in a, like if you were to take like a survey of your if your if your emotional state was measured on a line graph, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you took an average of that, say five years ago today, I bet it would be generally speaking higher. Maybe the lows even go lower sometimes, but. Uh, I bet in a general sense, it's, it, you feel a little bit more like you're standing on, on, on stable ground emotionally, right? Yeah, I am more stable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, I would agree with that statement. So, I mean, it's, it, so, but how do you get yourself to, to not, let me ask you this. Were you predisposed as a young person? Because there is predisposition. I think, you know, like, like brain chemistry, DNA, and that stuff figures into part of how we turn out, uh, at least, you know, a lot of people think. Uh, I'm no geneticist or scientist, so I, I, you know, I only, I hear things on the PBS. Um, but that supposedly, you know, your chemistry figures into some of this stuff. Uh, were you predisposed to respond badly to authoritarianism, or was this something you had to fight with? Going back to this idea of, like, asking permission to do the things you want to do. Uh, well, let's see. I'd say my particular demon has more to do with uh, just uh, a harsh critique, but actually uh, having something to focus against in my environment gets me to act. So, um, 
and it's always been the case from a very young. So when somebody says, "No, you can't do that," your reaction is to say, "Oh yeah, watch me." Is it something like that? Uh, if it's it's um, happy to learn why I can't do that. Okay. And I'm not afraid to ask why can't I do that. And if I don't like the answer why I can't do that, yeah. I might go demonstrate why I can do that. Okay. Okay, so it's not like it's not like a, uh, you know, it's not an instant uh, retaliatory kind of thing. Okay. The, uh, not wanting to subjugate. Yeah. For no good reason. I mean, so because people will have more information than I have. This, you know, something. You know, might be unstable or unsafe or, um, uh, yeah, risky in some way that whatever you know, adults or older, older children or whatnot will may have good ideas and and uh, yeah, as long as I can understand why it's a good idea. See, I I was a very obedient kid. I was the kid who got really good grades, did everything the teachers asked of him. I had perfect attendance in my senior senior year of high school. Senior year, where you're supposed to really goof around, go to Taco Bell and cut classes and everything. Um, I did have that one little brush with defiance where I, I flunked Algebra 2, and I, I know I told that story before. But um, but for the most part, I, I really did submit to you know anybody who seemed like they knew what they were talking about. I was like, well, I'll just defer to their judgment. They know. I don't. Uh, and so a lot of my own personal um, you know, art explorations, like that my interests kind of happened like in my time. It was like my dirty secret. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's like, well, I'll draw comics when I get home because I can't draw them in art class. I'll get in trouble because she wants me to paint like Georgia O'Keeffe. You know, so I won't fight that fight or anything. I won't try to convince her of my way of thinking, or I won't try to incorporate comics into the project creatively. Um, not that I was getting slapped on the wrist with a with a ruler or anything, but you know, I, 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 I don't, I don't know what switch flipped in me when when I started to change my mind on that. But I do remember the moment where I really felt like a kind of an assurance that. I didn't need to be part of this kind of big existing ecosystem in order to get satisfaction out of this thing. It was in 1993, or maybe it was 94, at the Motor City Comic Con when I went to, I, I had a portfolio, and I was walking around going to all these different tables, like showing these different publishers my work. And this one guy, uh, he was at like a, this rinky-dink local publishing house. Uh, they weren't even a publisher. This is when everybody was calling themselves an imprint or something like that. And like it, it, it wasn't even an imprint of something. It was like, we're an imprint. And no, you're a publishing company. It's just that you're two guys with a printer. You know, Just call yourself what you are. But um, I, I went up and I showed him my samples. And he's like, well, these are really good. You clearly you know, really are excited about this. And you, you're making some good strides and everything. But here's the problem. You don't draw like Jim Lee. If you could come back with some samples that look just like Jim Lee's, you can work for me. I'd be glad to give you work. Because like, Jim Lee's stuff sells, and we, we only hire artists who work in styles that sell. And I remember, I mean, this was partly me just being like the defiant 19-year-old, like, whatever, old man, you know, you don't know me. You know? But it was also partly like, wow, really? That's what it takes to get along in this universe, in, in this ecosystem that you guys have built, is that I have to do whatever is the marketable thing and follow whatever has proven itself in the past. Because uh, I don't want to do that at all. I mean, I, it's, I like Jim Lee's stuff fine, but I don't want to draw like Jim Lee. I want to draw this way, the way I'm headed. Um, so like, it was, it was at that moment that I felt like this kind of falling away of the whole notion of wanting to be in that system. Um, I'm happy to do it if the money is there and if they want me to work for them and if they want me to do it on a project that I'm interested in. Um, great. And I have since. But um, the idea of like working in some kind of house style or doing some kind of marketable story um, just felt so, I don't want to say like I was like, you know, uh, outraged you know, disgusted and knocking the microphone over and walking out of the room. But it was more like, oh, that doesn't sound very interesting. No, I, I don't think, I'm, I'm going to go do this thing over here because that sounds kind of boring, you know. It's more like that. You know, again, naivete. Very gentle reaction. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, yeah, I guess that, that is a, a bit of a bucking of a, an authority kind of thing. I mean, but you run into that. You, you don't you don't know, and someone else who has had more of a of a context than that's or more ex, what you're assuming is more experience and what you're desiring um, 
it can be catalyst, right? One way or the other, because it's like, wow, this person convinced me to not proceed, or this person convinced me to change my approach. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, like you give them that, that authority, right? Yeah. Um, one way or the other, whether you react positively or negatively, um, in a way. I think the only way to, I've, uh, that probably sounds all self-helpy and, and, and prescriptive, but I'm more like just thinking about the dynamic of it, right? Where you have, uh, you have an interaction and whether you react strong or, or strongly positive or strongly negative, then they've determined you somehow, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, yeah, cause there, there are times where like some, acknowledging somebody's expertise is super useful. Right. This isn't about like everybody should just go out and be anarchists or anything, um, because uh, again, going back to when I met Dan Mishkin, I gave him some of my books. He looked through some and he's like, "Oh, you know, your lettering really needs a lot of work." And I thought I was really good at lettering. I was at the point where I was writing tutorials on my website about how I letter because I thought I'm, I'm, I know what I'm doing here. And it was really kind of it, it, it was a painful uh, arrow to take from somebody that I respected that what I thought I was good at, I wasn't very good at. And he pointed out where I was going wrong and. After that initial five minutes of feeling really, you know, pouty, <laughs> like, oh, gee, I'm not as good as this thing as I thought I was. I'm just going to pack up and go home. Uh, as soon as that was out of the way, I was like, you know, he's right. I, that does need a lot of work. Holy crap. I wasn't thinking about this nearly as deeply as I thought I was. So that was a situation where, yeah, it, it was proper for me to submit or to acquiesce to some, some input from a source, like critique, you know, but... Uh, I don't know if we're going off topic here because I, I really want to get at this idea of something really brilliant that you said to me off recording um, where I was talking about the sense of like people accusing me personally sometimes of being an egotist. And you said, but well, that's, that's a natural response for people to validate their position of submitting to a thing, right? It's natural for people to say, uh, if I see you striving in outside of the ecosystem that I've taken as I'm paraphrasing what you said now so please since you're here correct me if I'm wrong of what I'm saying um, if I see somebody striving out <laughs> well it... <laughs> oh god this gets tricky I'm not saying you're an authority here I'm just saying that I'm using I'm, I'm expressing what I thought were your thoughts and I don't want to misrepresent somebody who I respect so um but this, like, if I see somebody striving outside of the system that I have taken for granted, then the easiest way for me to reconcile that is to say, well, you're just being a jerk after all, because I know that this is the, the, the thing to do. So was that vague enough? <laughs> it's vague enough where I, I remember the general situation. Like, even I remember the general situation, but not the, the exact details. And that, that's cool, because I think it was a some kind of personal anecdote or whatever. But it's... Uh, Let's see. Um, it's it, when when I run into this when I'm trying to um, trying to analyze something to like make a piece of software or whatever. This is when I commonly run into that when um, you know people have their certain expectation for how things work and and then they really have a lot of other big laundry list of reasons why it it needs to either stay this way or change or whatever. And and I just and then. That conversation reminded me of, of that situation where um, sometimes when someone shares a strong opinion, it's just as it's it's about just justifying how they're how they are seeing it. And uh, which and and I think I'm going to resist mentioning books I've mentioned a trillion times on podcasts, but it's 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 about uh, yeah like fear of loss. Right? If I'm wrong here, then I. I'm really fundamentally bad somehow. I'm incorrect. I mean, my my ideas are like part of my genetics, and that means I'm genetically flawed kind of thing. I don't know. That's like my... Uh, yeah. Did I get at what you were kind of? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, this comes back to this idea about um, submitting to an accepted idea of the way things are supposed to be. Welcome to real life, kid. How many times do you hear that? Or, 
uh, you know, the old anecdote that everybody passes around, and who, so who knows if it's even true, but, you know, it's, it's the kid who says, I don't want to eat my peas, and the dad says, so what? I haven't done anything I've wanted to for 30 years. That's the way it works, you know, and, you know, people who submit to those kinds of uh, premises and everything, um, it's, it's scary to think, to ever be confronted, no matter what stage you are in life, it's scary to be confronted with the notion that that may be fundamentally flawed, and therefore I... A, I'm wrong all the way down to the core, and B, I've wasted time and when I could have been doing this other thing. You know, and I think that's why that's probably why like self help stuff is so popular with, with people because it's such an easy, quick little thing to take now. I'm doing this inspiring thing on the stage and I'm telling you that you can do the impossible and everybody feels good right now and then go back to your lives and I haven't given you anything that's actually useful that you can implement right here today except this three stage thing of these three vague uh, ways of thinking. It's like first stop and analyze the situation, then assess what your opportunities are and then express yourself, you know, that kind of nonsense. Um, you should write a book. <laughs> I know I lifted that from somebody else. But... Uh, um. No, it, uh, it's funny. It, I don't, and it's not even black and white as far as, uh, I mean, uh, I'm just, I'm going to try to disclaim and then jump into a, a brief anecdote. Okay. So, like, disclaiming, huh, I mean, this doesn't work, it doesn't work one way, and uh, it's different for everybody or whatever, but, uh, no, that's a crappy disclaimer. It's, uh, it's it's legitimate to have you know strong feelings and be attached about you know to how you how you see stuff and if you're like no really I can't create because um, I really want to achieve this ideal and you know somehow when when I share my notebook with my friends and they compliment it it makes me angry because it's against how I'm seeing it right mm -hmm. um, that's valid that's okay I mean uh, I hope yeah I I don't I don't share that opinion. Right. I mean, so that's the disclaimer where it's like, I understand, I acknowledge it. I've had that kind of challenge before. I'm going to kind of mention an anecdote related to that. But at the same time, I, um, I don't agree that that's a, a good place to, to stay. Um, but, but, and at the same time, it doesn't go one direction. Um, so when, right around the same area that you were speaking of, Jersey, I had been doing a lot of... Uh, a lot of puzzling, you know, like, well, what am I going to do next and all that? And I started uh, playing around with uh, you know, getting back into um, programming and getting into digital art, and I got one of those. Um, I mean, I just started kind of practicing and leveling up, figuring out what's next. And, it, and I realized that I, I, what I was doing was all leading toward making a video game. And uh, so I started, I'm like, how in the world could I pull this off? I mean, I don't have the funding to just go pay people. Um, I don't really have the time to do it myself because I'm paying, you know, the, the rent here, whatever, et cetera. And uh, big puzzle. So after a while noodling and I've been, you know, checking out books from the library and business and whatnot, I thought, you know what? Like, well, what if I did a business? And what's funny, this is, you know, some people would call this speculative spec work and it's all the devil and whatnot. But here's where I was trying to get out of a loophole with that is I thought, well, what if everyone just believed in the project? Yeah. You're just doing it because you believe in it, and uh, you know we we define it together. We make a, this game that we care about, and and we get a bunch of skill doing it, and hopefully get jobs in the industry or make money off it or whatever, right? So I, I actually took this idea and I shared it with a bunch of friends on a on a trip that um, do every year up to a cabin and whatnot, and and uh, it. It was ill met. <laughs> it sounded what I got was a lot of my friends at the time were were um, they were you know working through some portion of college and uh, you know, sharp bunch of dudes and gals and they uh, some of them were like interns like one of them was like an intern at this think tank company and you know and working alongside like some really advanced computer programmers and he's like dude computer programmers have you know cars and you know who knows, alimony and uh, all these, you know, they've got bills to pay. They're not going to give you their time. You're crazy. Absolutely nuts for thinking of this. And I actually bounced that up. Now, with this shock of like, man, I really thought I had this figured out, and then realizing, well, what if no one shares my belief? And then 
other friends uh, echoed the initial friend's opinion. <laughs> and so I tabled the idea. Um, can I can I interrupt just for a second? I want to I want to ask you to give me a sense of that emotional state when the, everybody said you're nuts, when all these trusted friends said that you're nuts and this is a bad idea. Because this is the part of the story that whenever you see these movies made, like Tucker, uh, you know, the man with a dream, uh, th those get blasted in the hero's face, and the hero's always like, well, gosh darn it, I'm just going to roll up my sleeves and I'll do it anyway. And, and then the, the music montage plays. Um, so there's it, it, it is really important that people understand that when you have this thing you're thrilled about and you go, hey, at all the people who you trust, and they go, ah, oh, that's low, isn't it? It hurt, uh, it hurt really bad. It makes you question uh, if everything you've ever thought is dumb, you know, at least for me it did. Yeah, I mean, because, I mean, so, whatever. At the time, I mean, I was working third shift as a janitor, right? And, uh, you know, uh, I think I was a manager at the time or whatever, but, like, still, I, I, mean, I was like, wow, I thought I had pieced together, like, kind of my next step in life, right? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, hey, I had a job where, for better or for worse, I did a lot of thinking and meditation and and pondering ideas and a lot of creative stuff um, because the rest was just just disciplined motion anyway. And uh, so I thought I really noodled on this idea quite a bit. And, you know, when I finally presented it, it's not like it was like a, it was almost like a, a Yahoo um, add a couple of drunk people and put it up at a, at a lake cabin instead of being in a boardroom. But it was pretty much like that. But I did put on my presentation, right? Yeah. That I've been preparing for so long that, was so ill met and it crushed me. I felt horrible. Yeah. And uh, and then it, I mean, it basically then I just kind of said, well, I have to keep I have to keep working on it, and I just don't know what to do, right? And I feel bad, so we'll see. So a few months passed. Did you, uh, what, did you have a question, Drew? No, no, no. I'm just responding emotionally with my face. Uh, it's like <laughs> yes, and <laughs> doing that with my so, face. Um, this may be the the Tucker moment that you mentioned, which I haven't seen that movie, um, but I love it. It's a good movie. Oh, um, so I was subscribing to a few different uh, resources at the time that were my part of my info stream thing, where I'm, I was like, oh, okay, I'm soaking in this industry, even though I'm not working in it and whatever. And I'm like thinking about the tools and the process and picking up skills and whatever, and. Uh, it was uh, Game Informer. So the two magazines I was reading, reading not Game Informer, silly, no, no. Um, it was um, uh, Game Developer magazine. And then the other one was Morph's Outpost on the Digital Frontier, which unfortunately isn't around anymore because I love that magazine. Um, it's got a cool name. You do a search for it. It was a lot of fun. I mean, it was, it was heavily Kai's Power Tools horrific. Um, but that was a beautiful, awesome thing at the time. I mean, you felt like I'm playing in cyberspace, but I'm looking at paper. Yeah. And there's a lot of fun creative articles. And whatever. It was, anyway, so it was that. So I still kept, I didn't just quit. So I kept this info stream going. And all of a sudden, there was an article in, I think it was the October issue of whatever, 1994 October issue of, of uh, Game Developer, that talked about a, uh, uh, someone who was developing games for the 3DO which was a system at the time, um, with the same business model. And that was it. <laughs> I'm like, you're kidding me. So, like, here I am, a janitor, Yahoo, whatever. I go to Barnes & Noble religiously. I have these megas, you know, whatever. And, and I bounce this idea that I thought for, you know, months and months about. And there is someone using it. And so then what's, here's what's interesting is so that did validate me a lot, and it pissed me off. <laughs> and I was like, that's it. Nothing is stopping me now. Yeah. And so that's when the music queued up. Okay. And uh, that's when I called the A-team in. And <laughs> we welded the sheet metal to the van yeah. and crashed it into the bad guy's base. And then we all got jobs in IT. <laughs> <laughs> the end. Yep. Uh, 
No, yeah, I, I, I like that. I like that there was like a clumsy moment in between because that, that, that's the thing they always take out of the movies is the clumsy moments in between of you just kind of shuffling around going, well, I guess I don't know what I'm doing, you know? Uh, and, and I also like how when you saw that story, you didn't go, damn it, it's too late. It's too late. I can't do it now, you know? Uh, somebody else already did. He, they, they've got uh, first dibs on getting to live that life, you know? Success, there's only so much success in the world, and only so many of us get to have it. Keep saying things that just rile me up. <laughs> I'm trying to. No, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I could not tell. Yeah, I would imagine I probably physically transformed, <laughs> like, when that, when that occurred. Um, <laughs> without a doubt, then there was plenty of doubt and challenges after that. Sure. Thing, right? The general, like, I'm going in this direction now. Yep. Right. That just was. Now that's part of my DNA. And yeah, metaphorically yeah. speaking, it's part of your DNA. That's, that's a good way of thinking about it, is like you, you mutate a little bit. Hmm. You know, it's like yeah. it's, I, I went into, I, I got into doing the comics thing with a sense of naivete, with uh, this whole, um, oh, I don't want to draw like Jim Lee. That sounds boring. I'm going to do it my way. And, I, well, how are you going to make a living, kid? I don't know. I'm, I'm going to make the comics the, the, the way I want to. Um, and and I, I found myself, through trial and error, getting arranging my life to such a way that permitted me as much time as possible to do that. I mean, okay, so we've, we've mentioned on the show before that I was a blackjack dealer. One of the reasons I became a blackjack dealer was because it was a really, really well-paying job in that town that I was living in. I mean, it was the best money you're going to make in town. So much so that I could afford to only work two days a week at that job, pay for my bills, pay for my apartment, pay for gas in the car, pay for food and everything, all the other little tiny luxuries I needed. Um, and then I had five days a week to work on comics, you know? So... Efficiency. Well, I mean, and it wasn't like... I didn't sit down and go, well, what's my plan? I'm going to come up with a bullet-pointed list here, and this is what I'm going to do by this date and this date. I mean, yeah, eventually you do have to eventually kind of do that as, like, as life gets more complicated and you get more things in your life, like families, <laughs> you know? Uh, if you have any kind of relationships in your life, th things are going to get more complicated, and so you do have to sort of plan ahead for that, those kind of things. But, but you know, you, when you're starting out, even if you're starting out well into, you know, your life, like, for instance, uh, one of the stories... That, that this is one of the things where I got really riled up as I was listening to uh, a cartoonist tell somebody in their 30s that, oh, you're starting now? Well, it's too late. You can't do it now. And for a working cartoonist to say that to somebody, I mean, even if their stuff was really raw, I mean, who are we, any one of us, to say what what authority was granted to us to be able to determine what somebody's future is going to bring, what kind of discoveries they're going to make, what kind of things they're going to develop that nobody ever imagined before. Now, I worry a lot about giving bad advice to my students, right? I got kids who come to me saying, should I go to art school or not? I'm like, ooh. <laughs> I don't, and they're like, well, you didn't finish college. I'm like, oh, no, no, don't pull that one on me, you know? Because <laughs> your mom and dad are right over there, and I don't want to interfere in your family's business, right? Um, so I don't want to give bad advice, but to just cut somebody off at the past like that and say, oh, it's too late. You know, you're just starting out. You can't do this thing. Uh, wh wherever you're starting out, you know, you can, you start with a sense of, at least for me, I started with a sense of, well, I'm going to do this because it's fun and I like it and, I, and it'll, I'll figure it out. I'll figure this out. I have the confidence in myself to figure this out eventually. And then some hiccups start happening, some bad things, you know, some disappointments and setbacks happen and you, and you go, oh, gosh, I, I have no business doing this. And then, Something happens like that transformative moment for you where you're like, oh, no, no, not again. This is not going to happen to me again, you know? And it's, it's, it really, uh, trying to describe that emotional state for me, it feels really cold and very brittle, but it feels really empowering too when you feel like that, you know? It's like, like a part of you, like this, like this, like really, like, kind of soft emotional part of you, at least for me, it died a little bit. And then I, I like, sort of stole myself, steeled myself to, to like never feel that way again and just punch through whatever that's going to be. Um, for me, it was giving myself the permission, and this goes back to something that you had uh, originally pitched as the idea for this episode. And I don't want to go too long, but this is interesting. Saying, oh, I'm just a penciler. Oh, I'm just an inker. I'm just a programmer. I'm just a musician. Um, 
I, I've got a skill set, and it's it's no good in any other field except this one. I was totally that guy. I was what was setting me back early on was I'm a penciler. I got to find an anchor. Oh, my scripting sucks. I got to find a writer. Um, that was just my way of punching out of having to learn how to do those things, right? And then and then when that that threshold happened, and I got screwed over on a deadline very badly by a partner, and that was the moment where I was like, it, it was it was a moment where. Uh, one of the few, like maybe six times in my life, where I was like, I was so angry, I was just, I was trembling with anger because of this, this situation I found myself in, and I was so angry not at the person but at myself for allowing it to get to this point. And uh, after that, I was like, no way, I am not working with anybody ever again. I'm going to learn these things. I'm going to do it myself, so I don't have to count on some jerk to to do that part for me. I I will figure this out. I don't want to, but I will. You know, is that is that similar to the mindset that you had when you read that magazine? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think I would write a different poem as far as my, the feelings inside <laughs> I had, but, uh, but I think it's a, it's different for everybody. Right. It's a sim- of course. Similar result. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I found that a lot of, a lot of th- a lot of times when I come up with inventive stuff, it's, re- it's in response to being pissed about something yeah. and it's just kind of in my, that's in my DNA, and but um, the whole uh, the the willful pigeonholing thing, and yeah. I, I'll do that too. I mean, like I did that with uh, writing with Art Geek Zoo part way through it. I said, "Oh, it's too hard. It's it, it it's really stressing me out. I need a writer." Yeah. But, and um, I think. That just, I, I totally respect when people find, uh, it, for me, it comes down, it comes down to, well, what do I care about? What do I, what am I trying to accomplish here? And then what, what do I need to, and what do I have available to make this work? So it's creative limitation stuff. So if I'm like, well, I do have a partner, I don't have a partner. How do I bring this about? Is it too complex without partners? Too expensive? Mm-hmm. Um, do I need to be part of a, uh, um, do I need to go work somewhere? for this experience yeah. Um, because I really need a big team. You know, I want to make big budget motion pictures. Well, there's not that many people that could inv- individually fund that. Right. Uh, of course, of course. This isn't, yeah, I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I said to mean like you could do everything in the world all on your own. You can smash an atom if you just work hard, you know. Uh, it's it's not that simple. That would that would be a mischaracterization of what I was describing. What I was trying to describe was this kind of transformative moment of saying, no longer will I keep myself from learning what I need to learn in order to do the things that I want to do, right? Um, and I'm not going to box myself out of it by either A, saying that, well, Dad thinks it's a good idea if I do such and such, or B, saying that, well, after all, I'm just such and such. You know, pigeonholing yourself into some kind of... Well, gosh, you know that—that's like something that smart people do. I can't do that, you know. Well, that's somebody with people with like good business training do, you know. Maybe that is egotistical. Uh, I think it takes some ego, though. It it, it does, and I I think if uh, there's there's a healthy amount of that 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 is really helpful, and I, you know, so what if I'm, I'm and that's a self helpy thing. <laughs> I honestly don't care if uh, to. To feel good enough to to go through whatever questions and that you need to go through to to um, create the thing you care about. That's awesome. And mm-hmm. I, that getting to that point where it's like, oh, okay, I I realized I needed to learn a lot more about writing, and uh, but I didn't let that stop me. Right. Either. It, it's uh because I I also one of the big things I learned for like creative blocks that relate to this, and I've done a Polytechnic cast on it, so I don't need to belabor the point. Uh, but it's just the idea of when you get you get experience working on something, you're going to get new questions, new perspective. You're gonna your definition of what is finished and what is good or good enough or perfect will keep changing. Mm-hmm. And um, I I really let's see if you add to that like uh, and maybe eh, some could argue an unhealthy amount of interest in. Um, in exploring and self-improvement, you can have an infinite feedback loop 
and never, ever, ever finish anything, which is, well, obviously, I did, it wasn't never for me because I stopped. Yeah. Um, I started to, yeah, because for me, the, the, I, was, I was, you know, holding myself back from part of the experience that I needed mm -hmm. to do that. And so, but yeah, you know, it's different for everybody because even like, looking at like 24-hour comic day, there was so many different styles and how people would go about, like, what do they feel is a, is a definition of, like, a finished page? And How do you know when it's it done? Just, yeah. It was a perfect example of, like, it's, you know, what is finished is different for everybody. Yeah. And, yeah, that, that's another tough one to try to define and pin down. It's like, that's a, that's a gut reaction thing most of the time. And everybody's going to have a different opinion on what, you know, if I think, think it's done, that doesn't mean Dan Michigan's going to think it's done, right? Doesn't And what, three quarters of the way for me might be done to somebody else. You know, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a gray area. And that's one of the things that, you know what, we have to live with, not just as artists, but as human beings, is that sometimes things are ambiguous. <laughs> Oh no! I gotta go back to submitting to authority because they put things in a nice, clear con contextual terms and then put them in these little areas of concern, so I don't have to worry about that anymore. No, we have to fake our way through stuff sometimes. Oh no! You know that's what you call being a human being. That's what you call being a grown-up, really. <laughs> Welcome to adulthood. <laughs> oh no! Just the ambiguity. Use yeah, the the weapons yeah. of the enemy on me. Oh man! So terrible with that. Sorry, I'm just joking around. Yeah. <laughs> I hate you so much. <laughs> oh, but but yeah, no. This is one of the areas that I, I get really I get ticked off when when I talk about this with people who I'm close to. I mean, I don't you know in, in the classroom environment where somebody pulls this on me, you know, the whole um, well, so and so already did this. Uh, well, I'll never be that good. I'll never be as good as that guy. You know, I, I always try to be patient and nurturing about this. Like, well, you know, th let's think about that statement for a second. Let's really dig at it. Like, you know, so that before that person existed, nobody was ever that good and nobody ever will be that good again. Uh, let's look at this person's biography and see who their influences were. Who did they look up to? Who do they aspire to be? Oh, does that mean that the people who came before were somehow better than them? You know, the, 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 somebody's greatness does not refute future greatness, right? And so... But when, when it's people that I know really well, it's like, I just get, I fly off the handle about this. Like, really, you're going to let the existence of something that you really enjoy, you're going to poison that thing that this person made out of a sense of generosity and enthusiasm. And I mean, even, let's face it, even if it's something where it's like, you know, heavy metal, where it's like singing about, you know, aggressive demons and things that person is coming out of a sense of generosity and enthusiasm and love of this of the topic right no matter what it is uh and you're going to take that and you're going to poison it by saying that it prevents anybody else from doing anything after that now i know that most people mean that as a compliment most people mean that to be like oh it's so great like i joke that ernie cologne one of my favorite artists i i, that I joke that oh i suspect he's literally from another planet because he's so ingenious and so good at what he does but the reason it, that I know it's a joke is because if I truly felt that way, if I truly felt that he was so unique and so gosh darn talented, then I would just put the pen down. I wouldn't do it anymore. I had that moment. I had that moment back in like 2002 when I discovered Derek Kirk Kim's work. And I was so blown away by it. And I found out that he was a year younger than me that I was just like, Bleh! why even do it anymore? And I, I, I honestly considered stopping comics uh, for about, I don't know, maybe a good couple months. I was in a real state over that. But uh, I don't know what kicked me back into it again. I guess it's like... Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that, uh, it's really not a straight line. Yeah. You know, I mean, whatever. It's just, I, yeah. Um, I guess, you know, creating stuff can be tough and emotional. It doesn't matter if you figured out the solution that you needed uh, 10 years ago. You can face the damn problem again and again and again. And, but, and it may be really hard every time. Yeah. But, uh, uh, that's the, that's just to, to point that out. I, I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Just because it's not you know, to come off as like you know whatever. I face this thing. I'm fixed. No, I don't. No, I don't have the doubt. I win. Yay! <laughs> Let's all celebrate me winning. Yeah. And then now we're done talking about it or whatever. There's more to it than that. It's more complicated yeah. and it keeps going. And. That's okay. I, I don't. I, I don't. Know what, I have nothing else. I, it's even saying that's okay. It just. I don't even know how to finish that sentence. <laughs>
I love this. I got you flustered. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, 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 no, I, I was glad that, yeah, it's, it's just, it's a powerful thing to notice that. It's yeah. just so easy to, to just look for that. Well, no, nope, that's perfect now. Now I don't have to think about it. And, and uh, no, nope, it can keep coming up. Here's, here's a good analogy for it, I think. A good way to, of, to think about it is, like, you know, one of the things that uh, I've often argued, well, let's talk about Spider-Man for a second, okay? Uh, because I, I grew up a huge Spider-Man fan. Like, when I turned, like, 14 until I was, like, maybe 22, I was, like, a nut for Spider-Man. And, uh, and then put it in perspective, I saw the first Spider-Man Tobey Maguire movie, walked out of the theater, couldn't take it. Um, thought it was just, uh, just, just a brutally bad movie, but that's just me. Um, why is everybody crying in those movies? That's what I want to know. Everybody's crying all the time, and they don't cry that much in the comic books. But um, <laughs> anyway, that's not, it's not to say that anybody who likes it is dumb. It's just that me personally. Oh. Too much I, well, I, I just want to admit I have not watched the Ghost Rider movie. And it's not even like Ghost Rider probably hit that level of whatever is Spider-Man, but like Ghost Rider meant a lot to me at one point in my life, and yeah. I have not watched the Ghost Rider movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's not that... I can't blame you. So on yeah. one hand, I can go, oh, silly, that was a fun movie, whatever, but nope, can't watch Ghost Rider. So it, yeah, it gets... I wouldn't even put it at risk. It gets dangerous when you uh, have a lot of emotional investment in the property, right? It's like, like I won't, I will not see the Michael Bay Transformers movies. I won't see them. You can't make me do it. Only you'd have to put a gun to me to get me in that theater to watch that movie. And then people say, "Oh, you're missing out on something. It's a different interpretation. You're all for a different interpretations." I'm like, "Not that one. Not that one. I've seen the pictures. I need all. I have all I need to know." And I got too much emotionally wrapped up around these characters and this premise for me to see somebody do that to it. Um, but guess what? That I get to feel that way. Other people get to like the movie. It's free world. <laughs> so, anyway, where was I going? Oh, Spider-Man. Uh, some people make fun of the fact that the Spider-Man formula is this. Uh, uh-oh, Aunt May is sick and the rent is due. Uh-oh, I don't have any money and I got my own bills to pay. Uh-oh, J. Jonah Jameson's yelling at me. Uh-oh, there's the scorpion. He's hitting the, blowing up the building. And uh, I got to do this while I'm supposed to be doing that. And I got this other stress in my life. And then he gets down in the dumps and he says, Oh, why do I even do this to myself? Why do I keep pushing myself? Then he goes back home and Aunt May says something really inspirational about Parkers are tough. And he's like, Yeah, you know what? She's right. I'm not going to get upset anymore. Next issue... Oh, no, Aunt May's sick. Oh, i got to pay the bills. He goes through the same cycle over and over and over again. And some people go, that's repetitive. That's what made Spider-Man so great for me as a kid, because he was going through this, this pretend cycle to prepare me for what I was going to go through as an adult, is that it's cyclical. You go through it again and again and again. It is a little bit repetitive sometimes. <laughs> sometimes you hear yourself say, like, oh, am I really feel this way again? Uh, but as, as life is, yes. You know, and... Uh, I don't know. I, that 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 is total self helpy dribble. But uh, that that that's one of the things that when I look back on Spider Man, I'm like he doesn't need to grow or get old or go through like other kinds of real problems. Like oh no, somebody's taking drugs. Unless it's an interesting story to tell in the context of the thing that you're trying to do. But as long as Aunt May is sick, the bills are due, J. Jonah Jameson is mad, and a bad guy shows up in town, you've got a serviceable story there. And then it's just watching Peter like hit the dumps again and get back up and keep punching. God, that was dumb. I'm sorry. No, no, that darn right. It's a. Uh, it. Let's see. Some stories. There's, there's even with the same ingredients. Um, there you go. I mean, what's funny is, uh, was that always the same writer doing that formula? I'm trying to think. Uh, no, it was, it was a collection of writers because I was reading like all the Spider-Man titles at the time. So there was D David Michelinie doing amazing, Gary Con Jerry Conway uh, doing spectacular. Who was writing Web at that time? I don't remember who was writing Web, but uh, you know, it, for all the the hype Todd McFarlane had around him, and I loved Todd McFarlane's art when I was that age. I'm talking like 14, 15 years old. What 14 year old in the late 80s, early 90s didn't love Todd McFarlane's work? Um, when he started writing Spider-Man, I was like, oh, I don't know about this. This doesn't make any sense. This doesn't feel like Spider-Man at all, you know. <laughs> but it looks cool. Uh, so it, anyway, I don't know where I was going with that. But there were a, a, a different writers handling them differently. David Michelinie scripts were always 
there was always the web slinging moment where he's swinging across town saying, boy, my life sure has changed since I got bitten by that radioactive spider, you know, where he retells his origin every episode. Spectacular Spider-Man that didn't happen quite as much. I would say that Spectacular, when Jerry Conway was writing, it was a bit more moody, a little bit more self-involved, and like, oh, nuts. Life sure is throwing me a curveball today, that kind of thing. So, like, even though, like, Spider-Man's story has been told many times, there's still even, like, concurrently different artists stepping up to say, I can put my voice into it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, was, everybody could tell it in their own way. Now everybody did it good, you know. <laughs> Web of Spider-Man was uh, patently silly, but that's one of the reasons I liked it. It was like a flavor of that of that cycle. Um but anyway, but yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's that, that's what we call a classic, isn't it? I mean, do, do, does anybody go to a, a play, a playing of Macbeth and go, ah, oh, I've seen this one? <laughs> uh, and that's, a, there, I don't know, it, it's, there's an element, it's not just for those people, too. Um, obviously, the, it's, um, the, particip- the participatory aspect is, is, uh, is worthwhile. It's just that, those guys were getting paid professionally to then keep participating in it that they, you know, so yeah, they were ready to take it on as artists to say, well, I'm not worried about not saying this because, you know, it's been done already. Kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, I was really doing my best to try to weed this to, the uh, one more point about the, uh, the pigeonholing stuff, because uh, there's another thing that I've found, like, even if I don't, uh, sometimes I'll try a new discipline not to assume that, oh, I'm going to keep pursuing this until I'm at a level of effectiveness that's going to be, this will be a part of my normal creative routine or life. I'll visit this once in a while or constantly, whichever. Sometimes I just try it to just see what it's like. Yeah. And uh, it's just that I think it's another example of how pigeonholing doesn't just stop what you produce. It, I think it'll stop what you think about and uh, what you could identify with. And that, that's a risk. So, you know, like being a, uh, uh, like one huge debate, you know, out in the, the, the world of UI design is should UI designers code? And I say it that way kind of dismissively because, boy, is it a, just a, there's a lot of, it's, it's almost trollish to even mention this, the, the question, but... Well, because um, it's, it suggests that there's an answer, that one of the answers might be is that no, they should be forbidden to code. It should be, I issue an edict here and now that a true designer does not code. And if you do code, you're out of the club. You don't get to play in this game anymore. You don't get to, it's, like, it's like the people who say um, paraprofessional. Have you ever heard that people use that term? A hair professional? No, para, P-A-R-A. <laughs> you're, you're messing with me. <laughs> it's like para. those those people call themselves hair professionals, but they're just working at Fantastic Sam's. No, I'm, I'm not... waiting for this. I'm like, wow, where's this going? <laughs> no, but it's like people who say para professional. Like, you're not a professional. You're sort of a professional. You're an outside professional because you don't have X, Y, and Z elements in your repertoire, resume, profile. You don't have this background experience, therefore, you're a paraprofessional. Um, I hear people say that sometimes, and it really, really grinds my gears. Because in the, the, the kind of, you reminded me of this with the whole, like, should, should this person do this? It, 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 it's tertiarily related to the... I'm sorry I'm stepping all over your points, Rob. I'm, I, you just got me riled up. It's tertiar- tertiarily related to this idea that um, I once heard a cartoonist say... Uh, Let's make the term cartoonist meaningful by defining what makes a cartoonist and what doesn't make a cartoonist. And to which I would say, okay, brilliant. Somebody who tells stories with uh, still pictures in a, in, in a sequence, that's a cartoonist. And that's the only definition you need. Oh, wait, here it comes, here it comes. Oh, you have to have this kind of degree of skill in illustration. Oh, you have to have this kind of background in education. You have to have this kind of background in writing certain kinds of stories. What? Really? You're going to throw that on me? No, you don't. No, you don't. Because it's, I rem- that You're getting me to the point where I want to mention that 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 is just justifying a different world perspective. That's all that is. It's sort of a, I come from a business model or a world of where we exchange value in training and uh, um, awarding people with this title. So therefore, if that, that world becomes invalid, if anyone can pick up this title. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I want to protect this idea. And it's, it's valid for them to do that. Go, go for it. I mean, go, you know, um, but I hope they bring something else to the mix besides, well, we get this word now. We're going to try to hog it, this word, like, you know. Not to be a hippie. I don't, I don't want to sound like a hippie about this, but. Hippie it up. You know, it used to be really important to me um, when I was starting out, like the day when I got my first miniseries, when I got the contract in the mail to do my first miniseries through a comics company, I remember turning to Anne and saying, like, I'm a cartoonist. I'm a cartoonist now, you know? I I'm real. Uh, I got the thing that says I'm real. Uh, I, got, I got the piece of paper from the wizard that says that I got a diploma. Now I can do the thing that the scarecrow says when he says the thing about the hypotenuse, right? Um, nowadays, I feel really constricted by that. I feel really like when somebody says, like, what are you? You know, what's your career? Like, oh, uh, I, I make comics and I teach comics and then I do a lot of advocacy for comics. I don't know what you call that kind of thing. And I don't want a word for that because, you know, what I am, I'm a guy who just loves comics a lot. That, that's really what you need to know. Um, so this idea of putting value on a word by defining it, I feel now, and again, I, 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 I suspect this means I need to move to uh, San Francisco is that I, I just feel like it's like, oh, wow, you're going to box it up that way, huh? You're going you're gonna to put it into this, these kind of contextual terms so that keeps these people in and these people out. Um, why do we even have to have names for that kind of thing? Names are provisional, after all. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, pe peace, Jersey. Peace. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, I like money a lot. <laughs> and I don't do drugs. <laughs> I wrote to my congressman. I wrote to my my state representative because I was angry about something. No, I'm I'm as I'm as white bread as they get. Oh my god, that's funny. No, it. Um. I you know I'm really cool with these things coexisting. Honestly, it. Uh, uh, it's just as long as um, what what bothers me is when people give up and they say, oh okay. I can't do that because the person who's waving the definition said that. Yeah. Because chances are, if they're waving the definition, there's a chance that they may have some really awesome ideas. You know, like um, I, I like abusing the saying, "A broken clock is right twice a day." Yeah. And uh, fair enough. I mean, and not every institution is broken or whatever. I mean, they they may have great, great ideas, and chances are. You know, they, they evolved out of doing something of service for their people and what have you. So anyway, there could be some useful stuff there. So I'm not dismissive of that either. It's just, um, yeah, it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't subject, subjugate my perspective to be filtered by what they are offering. That was a much more mature response to it than what I gave, uh, this idea that acknowledging that these things have their purposes and their uses, and this isn't about being like some kind of revolutionary to say, like, oh, that's the man trying to keep me down, and we got to destroy their system so that our new utopian um, anar our anarchist society can thrive in, in, in you know, when yeah, the... Fast forward to when you built institutions as well, and you go, oops. <laughs> yep. <laughs> No, absolutely. No, that's 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 exactly what I fear. You know, it's like I was just reading um, uh, Tron Times, one of his new graphic novels, and uh, he's he's being rascally when he when he does this, but uh, he wins this award. It's it's a biography. Uh, I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes. I forget the name of it offhand, but it's in my Goodreads. If you follow me on Goodreads, I I post links to things that I'm reading and enjoying. Um, but he, he wins this comics award, and uh, the, the reporters are asking him, you know, well, how do you feel? Does it feel like he's like, he's like well, you know, I, I feel like my interesting days are over because before I was fighting against the system, and now that I've won this award, I'm established. I'm the man. I'm the things that, that the young people are going to fight against now. And he's just doing this to play with the reporters to get them to write like misleading headlines about him and everything because it shows him like, afterwards leaving the interview snickering to himself because uh, he doesn't feel that way at all. But, um, but you know, it's... That, that is something that happens a lot of the time, right? Look where we are now with Apple computers, right? They were the rebels, now they're the man. Everybody hates them because they're the closed system and they, uh, they, they determine what things you can and cannot do with your machines. So, Yeah, there's some harsh critique out there that, uh, that that's probably a whole other topic. I mean, yeah, I've, um, I have a huge passion for computing and... Uh, 
yeah, a lot of that will will dictate that. And that's why I I, I landed on Apple because I care about completing projects. <laughs> I love love Linux and I love Ubuntu yeah. very much. I mean, uh, and and uh, just not to go off on a giant new tangent, but like when I was a few months into it and uh, using Ubuntu, I switched and my um, I'm just going to acknowledge my awesome wife in that. Uh, well, I had very strong feelings about switching from Windows at a point when she was doing her master's thesis. Wow. Uh, she still went along with it. That's the kind of woman you, that's the woman you marry who does that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I did. And, um, and I really felt like I experienced true human freedom for the first time. Wow. Like, this is what it's like to not be treated, to be treated with ultimate care and respect. This, you know, and, and to be in the computing world. And there, there, you know, sorry if that sounds overblown or whatever, but it was, uh, it was very powerful. And, and so even after that, then I did choose to, to add Apple to my ecosystem. And I, I find they coexist just fine. And I'm all the better for it as far as being able to get stuff done. So, okay. Can we summarize this in some way? And where are we getting here? We're getting to the point that sometimes people who have a degree of authority on a subject are worth listening to. Sometimes you have to measure that against what you hold to be true or what your sense of reality is and kind of listen to the, to the voice that makes the most sense. Um, but what you shouldn't do is let any sense any symbol of excellence any symbol of uh I, i'm trying to find another word besides authority because authority sounds like it's something that's imposed upon you um authority when, I, when i'm referring to authority here i'm talking about a sense of achievement they're an authority on the subject right they're an authority on making this thing they've done it to a certain degree of excellence that we all acknowledge they did it well um allowing their existence to make you feel like you are somehow um, ineligible to participate. So that's the submission. The submission is is the, the, the listening to a sense of a voice inside of you that says that I no longer have the uh, the right, who am I, to do such and such. That's the only sin. Is that fair? Am I using bad language? I probably am. It's a no, I, no, no. It's a really hard topic to summarize, right? Because yeah. you know, especially especially to do it in a way that that is a uh, uh, that somehow hits all the points without um, without sounding prescriptive. And yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, but we do lean into art, right? So right, we're we're big proponents of uh, yeah, get out and and create and try to try to work through that stuff. And if you do, if you are subjugating yourself. You know, hopefully you consider other options too, um, because yeah. yeah, it can be mighty convenient to have that nice um, position. Like, so you, maybe you are just a penciler, and that you love it, and that's awesome. You feel all, you know, super happy about it. Um, but it that good for good for you, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, and I don't mean yeah. I don't know. It's so well, hard to summarize this. That's what that is. Uh, Let me go back to the beginning. Let me go back to the beginning and talk about the anecdote that inspired this topic for me. Um, this, this, this friend of mine who I was talking to, who I was yelling at, this is a situation where I'm living next door to the guy who has the talent and the skill to be the big deal, in my mind. I think this guy is doing stuff on a par with anybody in this field that he wants to be in. Um, so instead of just going like, wow, you do really cool stuff, that's neat. I'm going like, why aren't you sharing this? Because this is really good, and I think people would respond to it, and I think you would be able to find yourself having more of your income coming from things that you're passionate about rather than things that you feel like you have to do. And when he said, oh, but so-and-so already did this, and they're really excellent, and I have no right because of the they did it. Well, he didn't say that. I, I put those words on there. But he said, like, well, what's the point of doing it when he exists? I'm like so, in other words, I gotta go back in time to kill this guy before he's even born, so that you can be the thing that you want to be, right? You know. But anyway, um, where was I going with this? Oh, I was trying to summarize a point here. 
uh, yes, I was trying to mix mix up the the different analogies we were making. Is that here was the guy who was talking himself out of doing something that I think he'd be really really good at and would really enjoy. Um, because and the reason I was angry was because I I found myself living next door to the guy who, by all rights, should be a lot more successful at what he's doing. And the only thing that's stopping him, really, the only thing that stops us from really finding out is whether or not we engage and share. I think. Um, because maybe he wouldn't. Maybe I'm totally wrong. I don't know. Uh, but at least, like, if he gave it, like, an honest effort instead of, you know, getting three quarters of the way there and then going, ah, no, 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 I'm not going to go in the water. No, no, it looks cold. You know? Um, we'll never know. And that, that's the part that really kind of breaks my heart. It's exactly. So I guess this whole topic is about us responding, responding to something that when we see it, it bums us out. And in some ways, mm -hmm. the winning card is just a general encouragement too of, of saying, go out and go out and do it. And because yeah. it's only going to, it, through that, you'll end up finding out lots of cool stuff. And obviously, we're here to, to help in that area. I mean, so in some ways, us talking about it is self-serving. In some ways, us talking about it is like, you know, just venting and, and dealing with this thing that it, it's just tough to watch. It happened. Yeah, and 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 the the irony. I'm for anybody who wants to email. You don't have to email because I'm well aware of the irony of us even addressing it. Because the, there's a, there's an implicit "be like me" message in talking about it at all. Uh, but as Rob pointed out, I think I think you very well pointed out that it's it's a complicated thing. There's a lot of things we're responding to here. It's not about like let's create a a podcast to help people realize that they can achieve their dreams. No, part of it is like, dude, this really really ticks me off, and I got to get it out of my system. Part of it is is that isn't it interesting that some people respond to it this way? I wonder why that is. You know, let's let's dig at it and try to understand it. And then part of it is is that maybe this content would be useful to somebody else. It's a lot more complicated than just writing a self help book. Otherwise, we would have written a self help book and you know, be living in Spain right now and hating ourselves <laughs> for, for bilking the public, uh, uh, you know, people who, who genuinely need help out of money. That looks great. <laughs> no, um, yeah. I, it, yeah, instead of going about something that would be, would make it tough to look in the mirror, we just had this uh, extemporaneous podcast on it. Um, I think there we go. We do a good job. We probably could craft an article on it or something, but, uh, and mm -hmm. then have more of a concise, you know, put a bow on it a little bit. Um, yeah. A little poem. Sell it as an ebook. Yeah, there you go. But but it's not it's not exactly it's not about the self help. It's we're responding to this. Um, I I have I personally have a concern about um, when when uh, when when creative people sort of just uh, kind of disengage. There there you go. That's what I observe. It's like a, when you dis when I see some disengaging from uh, finishing creating and getting it out there. So yeah. and so maybe it has to do with our, our dominate, you know, like the, the non-participatory culture that slowly is changing, thankfully. I mean, through yeah. Yeah. Uh, a variety of things going on in society now. And, but uh, uh, maybe, yeah, so maybe it's participatory culture. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. We don't know. That's, that's the summary point. You did it. You did it. We don't know. <laughs> We're off the hook. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> that's 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 the way I would end my uh my self help seminar. I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm out of here. <laughs> and I walk out with the briefcases with the money sticking out of the sides. Ah. <laughs> then we did it. It's did. complicated. I like it. I like it. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel good because I feel like we're being responsible by making by realizing that you know, uh, okay, you haven't seen Tucker. Um, have you seen uh, Time Bandits? In the end of Time Bandits, God leaves the kid abandoned with evil and says, "This is your fight," you know, and it ends on this very kind of strangely dark note. That's kind of awesome. Yeah, and then it just it just and it just zooms out. It zooms uh, like a, a bird's eye shot of the kid. It just zooms away and it zooms back from the earth and then to the entire universe and then like it shows God's hands rolling up the map of the universe at the end. And it's like it leaves it open ended. He's lit, he's, he's sitting there with a chunk of evil in his hands, and uh, you know you got it to carry on the fight on your own. Cool. That's a good message. Yeah, I like it.
as a kid, though, it scared the living hell out of me. <laughs> like, that's really how it ends? No parade? No, you know, award ceremony? What? <laughs> no vanquishing. Yeah. yeah. No. Well, there was... There, there was a, a form of vanquishing, but then, yeah, it, but, yeah, the kid watches his parents blow up in front of his face because they touch a piece of evil, and then he's left there holding it, and God just sort of bolts. So, Pretty cool. Yeah, that's fun. You know. It's a good movie. It's a funny movie. It's a very strange movie. It's Terry Gilliam, I think. Terry Gilliam and George Harrison put that one together, so it's very, very weird, but has his moments. Cool. Anyway, okay. Uh, you wanna you wanna get out of here? You wanna go home? You wanna go back to your life? You wanna play with those iPhone four, four uh, S's? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I don't blame you. No, I, I, this was good. I I I think it's worth. We tried to put a put a bookend on it, and uh, there you go. I mean, right. Not trying to just be yeah. Congratulate Pat. You know, self pat ourselves on the back. Whatever. It just it's worth trying to wrestle with it because I mean, it's. It's an interesting puzzle. There we go. We by all means have not solved it. No, I don't ever want to feel like I have, you know, because that that's the moment when I've when I've unplugged and I've stopped thinking about it because it's it, as you pointed out, there's always going to be more questions that get raised the deeper you get into something. So, oh God, I almost said the joy is in the journey. That was that was a long winded way of saying that thing. Oh. Life's a journey, Rob. I got, we gotta get out of here. I'm gonna start saying a whole bunch of self helpy things, and then I know yeah. we're breaking down. We're we're breaking down into self helpy components, like a like, <laughs> like decomposing, um, decomposing thoughtful people. Yeah, there we go. Okay, um, so if anybody listening found this discussion useful or interesting or God help me insightful, uh. You could go to iTunes and give us a star review. Uh, you know, say like that. That's your way of of letting other people know about us. A very simple way is going to iTunes, give give a star. You know, however many stars you think we deserve, and then it'll help people find the show. If you think more people should listen to the show, you could also you know spread the word on the different social networks and say, hey, there's a show I listen to. We had some people talk about us on Twitter recently, yeah, uh, thanking us. We appreciate those yeah. comments. Um, yeah. Rocks. So. You could do that, and then uh, we'll point people one more time. There's only oh, we should mention the random unlock. That's the new thing we've launched at leanintoart.com. For anybody who listens to this show through like their aggregator and haven't visited the site in a while, we rolled out a neat new thing. So what is it? Okay, so random unlock is for every single person that signs up now. They actually benefit everybody that signed up for 30 classes in 30 days because what happens is. One person signs up, boom, an, a random um, office hour meeting is for, with uh, Jersey and Rob or Jersey or Rob or whatever will unlock during the Thursdays and Fridays in November. So essentially you get more time with, which, which that is something that we get emails about is, is um, hey, when, are, you know, when can I um, just pay for an office hour? Well, guess what? This is a, this is kind of our way to roll that out and make like a super cool add-on to 30 classes. Right. So if you're already signed up, if somebody else signs up, boom, you get a new, you get a, an extra piece of the overall content system there. Uh, if you're new and you you sign up, just by signing up, you're automatically making it even better than it was before you signed up. Yep. So that's that's a neat way to. Uh, you know, add more content to it without turning it into some kind of uh, like, oh, if we get to X amount of signups, then we'll give you this. No, each new one gives you a thing. Yep. Uh, and there's very, I don't think there's a limit to how much you can add to that. So if like a thousand people could, no, maybe a thousand. I don't think there's a thousand hours in them in those day, the the days we're talking about. But add up the hours on uh, Thursdays and Fridays, and then subtract some for sleep. And then yes. Whatever's left. So there's a lot of them that we can unlock, and that there's a, yeah, plenty go around. I'll go without sleep for this. I'll I'll you know just forget about sleeping between Thursday and Friday, to to and when Saturday I guess, <laughs> or to help this thing out. Okay. So it could I, be I, an I office hour to watch Jersey drool. You know I knew. <laughs> <laughs> just the last one is me. Is like just kill me, just kill me, just kill me. But that might be fun. There you go. You know? You go. <laughs> I knew you guys were doing this. 
<laughs> you could do it just to abuse me. I, and from what I hear, that's actually quite fun. Uh, I, I always get really big laughs when I fall down and hurt myself. I mean, seriously, it, it always works. I could be standing in front of the Pope, and he would lose his composure if he saw me hurt myself, because apparently I make a lot of very funny noises when I'm in pain. So... So there we go. Okay. Uh, so that's at lean, in, lean into art dot com is where you can find the random unlock. I'll link to it in the notes for this episode. Anything awesome. else you want to make some noise about, Rob? Anything else? No, oh, that's plenty, man. We have uh, that's a big event. It's starting soon in a couple of weeks. Like twelve days or something like that. Yikes. Okay. Well. Thanks to everybody who signed up, and thanks to everybody who's helping spread the word about the the 30 classes and 30 days thing as well. Um, you. you can just, yeah, anybody who hasn't yet, you know, we'd appreciate it if you did. So, all right, well, thanks for downloading and listening, everybody. This has been fun. Good conversation, Rob. Yeah, and, good uh, conversation, Jersey. Thanks. And until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of interactive-storyteller.com and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, bye.